The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We typically find blue sucker and large woody debris, and boulders, so it's dangerous to be shocking these fish out of, but um, for the love of the fish. Eight of the lakes in this district had completely dried up, and one of those was here at Lake Wichita. What I really want to be is a storyteller. Show people things that maybe they haven't seen before. Everyone has a story. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Matthew Aker is searching for a blue ghost. It's here on the Colorado River where this team spends days, weeks, months of the year looking for a rare and threatened fish called the blue sucker. Currently, the blue sucker, uh, its status is somewhat unknown in the lower Colorado River. So we're not 100% sure how the blue sucker is doing. Whoa. Come on, blue. So they are here electrofishing to try and find them. So we're about 10 miles east of uh, Austin on the Colorado River. We're looking for that faster water and some type of structure. They're really adept at swimming in fast water. They're great swimmers. What's that? A smallmouth buffalo. <laughs> Blue suckers are very rare today. They used to be found throughout North America, but dams and poor river quality have led to their dramatic decline. This is the coolest fish. Most people would think it's a carp, but it is a fact it is a catastomid, a sucker. It's unique in that it has this really elongated body and it hangs out in these fast flowing waters, shoots and riffles that uh, most fish tend to avoid because they just don't have the energy budget to stay within that riffle. Bass. While the blue sucker is elusive, the team has another fish on their radar. Jess Peace is here studying the Guadalupe bass. Oh, is that a bass? The state fish of Texas. Along with tracking the movements of the blue sucker, we're also tracking Guadalupe bass movement. Wow, that's a good one, Jess. Previous studies have shown in the upper tributaries, which are smaller systems, that they're pretty sedentary and don't move that much. And down here with this bigger river system, we're seeing larger movements by these Guadalupe bass to uh, very specific habitats. Oh, wow. Wow, Jess. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> Yeah. Little Guad, 279. While Guadalupe bass are here, these big largemouth bass are all the buzz. His ploy number is 2304. This is just another indicator that uh, the Colorado River is, is gaining quick notoriety as a trophy largemouth bass and a Guadalupe bass fishery. Highly productive area. There's lots of food for these guys to eat, lots of cover. So we've seen a, a real increase in the, the utilization by anglers coming out here and fishing for specifically targeting Guadalupe bass and our bigger largemouth bass. As for the blue sucker search, no luck so far today. But Matthew knows this is where they like to hang out. What we've noticed the past couple of years doing this work is that the stretch between Austin and LaGrange tends to have the most blue sucker. It is very diverse. It has lots of twists and turns, and it's a little bit narrower. Biologists agree most fish prefer the natural flow of a river. 
and fish do best when dam releases mimic the seasonal high and low flows that they are used to. In any river ecosystem, what you're hoping for is a natural flow regime. And what that means is just a natural, natural hydrology. Those are essential to not only the blue sucker and the Guadalupe bass, to a lot of our critters. There's your buffalo. Shad hole. Come on, blue. We typically find blue sucker in large woody debris, lots of cobble and boulders. So it's generally somewhat dangerous to be shocking these fish out of when we're doing these marker capture studies, but um, for the love of the fish. in that fast water just where we expected him to be. It just took us a couple of passes through there. You just gotta be on your game. That is awesome, dude. So this is an adult male blue sucker. Uh, he's in great shape, very healthy looking. And he's about 696 millimeters, which is 27 and a half inches. So this is a pit tag, a passive integrated transponder. It allows us to uniquely identify individual blue suckers. We'll pit tag it right here, just under the dorsal fin. We take scales, and the scales we use to age the fish, to put them in a certain class, so we know how many fish were spawned in a certain season. Oh, it's so exciting to catch blue sucker. Um, we put uh, four hours of work into catching the single blue sucker, so fantastic. And now we're gonna release them. Using an antenna and a receiver, these two are out again. With radio telemetry, they monitor some of the 170 blue suckers that are now tagged. 114 at 62. There he is. The telemetry work that we do, we are able to tell where that fish is at that particular moment, and we can use that data in conjunction with flow data to determine when blue sucker are most likely to move. And this gives us a better idea of what blue sucker prefer. This study and the scientific data will hopefully help ensure that the Colorado's natural flow continues. So what we're really hoping for out of this study is to develop the science for the blue sucker so we as resource managers can better inform some of the water policy decisions and the management of our highland lakes there above Austin and how we can manage the river and the lakes as one system. As for Matthew, He's not going to stop the science anytime soon. Too often, I think that uh, natural resources and ecosystems as a whole kind of get overlooked. And what we need to do to gain that seat at the table to help influence uh, those people actually making the policy, we need science. We have to have the data. Get us some blue sucker out of here. And so that's why I do this every day. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish Restoration Program. I'm Devonte Hill and I'm 22 years old. I just graduated from college, you know, just looking for an opportunity to kind of get out before I start grinding in a regular job. What I really want to be is a storyteller. Show people things that maybe they haven't seen before. Everyone has a story. When you see things on TV about you know, outdoors and things like that, all you really see is a, a, a certain type of demographic. You kind of get raised thinking that, okay, these things are not really for me. 
And whether that's making documentaries. Whoa, chill out. You're almost getting off. You know, I just want to show people things that maybe they haven't seen before, give them a different reality. Yeah. There you go. I was a state park ambassador that got exposed to the Buffalo Soldier Program. Attention. I'm always open to new experiences. Oh. All right, we'll take your picture. I don't have too much experience with kids besides my cousins, and so they'll be interesting dealing with little people. <laughs> Salute. <laughs> the Buffalo Soldiers were created in 1866 to assist and protect the settlement as it continued to move further out west. What we have here today, guys, are the 10 essentials of outdoor living. These were the first black professional men in the U.S. Army, and they got their name from the Indians. When the Native Americans saw the Buffalo Soldier, he wasn't used to seeing a man of this skin color in the wool uniform. So the only thing the Indian could do at that point is compare this new soldier to something he knew out on the frontier. And that something on the frontier just happened to be the buffalo. They had a reputation of being fierce fighters, not backing down. Like a buffalo come running right through that right now, he wouldn't run around you or jump over, he'll run right through everybody. Yes, sir. Texas Parks and Wildlife started the Buffalo Soldiers Program to preserve the cultural history. We're about to go out on a scouting mission. And to connect people with the outdoors, get connected with the state park resource. What are these that he's drawn? When a participant comes to see the Buffalo Soldiers, about face. They are able to about learn about uh, what they did on the frontier, how they camped, how they cooked. That's hard, Dad. We use the Buffalo Soldiers' rich heritage and history to connect urban audiences who are not currently connected to their state parks to get them outside. Get them outside throwing a baseball. Get them outside walking the trail Water. to get them enjoying what's in their own backyard. All the landmarks that we saw, and we're going to make a list of them, and then we're going to make a map together. The Buffalo Soldier Program depends heavily on its volunteers. Sergeant says, point to the lake. When you're thrown into this situation, especially when you get to put on their uniform, you, you feel a connection automatically. They accomplished so many things, building roads, putting up telegraph lines, mapping out areas so they knew where watering holes were. Buffalo Soldiers were also some of the first professional mountain bikers. The Iron Riders blazed the trail of off-road biking for the country. The women that supported the Buffalo Soldiers were strong, pioneering women. They would keep records about what happened in town. The text messages that people sent today started a long time ago with the Buffalo Soldiers as they were working on the frontier stringing up telegraph poles. They were really pioneering this land that we now call America. Come on up here, because you're going to be batting next. There you go. You did good job. Oh, good job. The kids that we interact with, I hope that they leave with a sense of pride, with a sense of wonder, with a sense of curiosity. You don't need all this fancy equipment to play. So that they have a better understanding of not only the Buffalo Soldiers, but also where they come from. Good afternoon, how y'all doing? Black history is not taught in schools anymore. They don't talk about the kings in Africa. They don't, they don't do that anymore. We fought just like the Buffalo, just as brave, just as strong as the Buffalo. A lot of our inner city kids have problems because they don't understand the history. We showed that we were able to do what anybody else out here could do. These Buffalo soldiers were from an era where they created their own company with a high level of expectations, requirements, and it produced a lot of dignity. And if you didn't want to go outside and work, what do you think they said? Just do it, exactly. I'm just asking these kids to just go and do and be the best. And Buffalo Soldiers was some of the best. With segregation around, with these men combined into units of just other black men, going into settlements and towns where tensions were high, says a lot about their character and their spirit. 
As we all know, the Native Americans were pushed off their lands by the U.S. government. Buffalo soldiers were part of that mission, but at the same time, they were also trying to prove themselves to the U.S. government, to prove that they were more than three quarters of a person, of a man. So both of these groups were trying to show the leading power, the U.S. government, that they are both human. Anytime you, you listen to a story of people who have been put into really bad situations and still was able to do amazing things, that, that definitely has a sense of pride. Maybe I had a Buffalo Soldier in my family line at some point in time. That's really cool when you really think about it. I gotta put a little bit more muscle in that one, man. Come on now. This whole experience has just been one of those life-changing moments. Trying to get that one. I've never really done anything like this before. I never really did anything with kids before. And so there was a lot of firsts for me. But it definitely got me a lot more comfortable with you know, sharing history with people. Yeah, that's a good one. A lot more comfortable kind of getting outside my box and yeah. kind of exploring something new and something different. All of them represent fish that you can catch here in Texas. Wow. And learning. Stand by. Five, four, three, two. Coming up tonight at 10, a gruesome discovery. Of I got a job. Hopefully this is the first step to me continuing my training and, and practice at being a storyteller. And from there, we're gonna to go to camera three, back to two position. I see myself traveling through the beautiful state of Texas, telling stories about uh, a lot of the history here, along with some of the groups that are, are doing some great things. Who said it? Come here. Be <laughs> and this is part of my story. We are in Mule Slough in the back bay system of Port O'Connor, Texas. This is an isolated flat and it is surrounded by black mangroves and cord grass. I've lived here my whole life and I've, I've kayaked before, but um, just not here. This is my backyard. My backyard's always been outdoors for everything. And you get to sit in a kayak and you can see pelicans, seagulls, herons, everything. You get to see it all. Being out here in the water definitely calms me down. It's a um, it's just relaxing. Being back here in the water kind of brings me back down to earth because this place is home. I like how you can get into the, the smaller spots without making a whole lot of noise. Where there's nobody is pretty awesome. Look for redfish. So the Port O'Connor Paddling Trail is unique in the way that it's probably the most vast one on the Texas coast that's easily accessible. There's over 40 miles total of paddle trail. Hey Jade, look at that loon. That is just <laughs> a camera ready loon. He's getting his 15 minutes in. It is an adventure 
almost every time you come because you can get lost and that's okay. Uh, you can go into these secret bayous that no one knew existed that are mostly only accessible by a kayaker. This kayaking is a whole other experience and it's you and the water and nothing else. I mean, the saying goes, once you visit here once, you always come back a second time. You know, Port O'Connor has a way of bringing you back. It's a great place to be. I got into this field because I believe in the power of fishing and fishing participation and fisheries conservation. And I came to Texas Parks and Wildlife after having spent five years working for Kansas Wildlife and Parks. Now, no matter where you come from or where you work for, uh, if you're in the fish and wildlife field, you know just how great Texas Parks and Wildlife is. And so I want to jump at the chance. I'm Tom Lang and I'm the district fisheries supervisor out of Wichita Falls. I manage the fisheries resources for eight counties up here in North Texas. When I got to Wichita Falls, eight of the lakes in this district had completely dried up, and one of those was here at Lake Wichita. This is the third oldest lake in the state of Texas. How can you sit there and say that you care about the future of fisheries and fishing and turn your back on a 1,200-acre lake in the middle of 100,000 people? Let's start working the problem. Let's start figuring out what do we need to do to try and make this a viable fisheries resource again? Tom has brought Lake Wichita back to life. Tom is the one that brings to this entire project a wealth of knowledge and an absolute passion for doing things from the beginning up. When he sets his mind on something, nothing stops him. And he went through this community, partnered with so many different people, the number was $4.2 million that he was able to to bring for us to tell our story. A project of this magnitude is expensive, and to have the community that we have here and the, and the resources that we've been able to have, uh, to be able to get the ball rolling on those, has really been important and very special. It's well past its prime. Is approved for the first phase of a project that will make improvements out at Lake Wichita. It's time to reinvest in our lake. This project is such a, a big project. It's got so many um, different facets about it. We're starting a lake over, so we're going to drain the water, the little bit of water that's in it, and we're going to dig it out and double the storage capacity. This is something he does because he knows that a project like this is going to leave decades of benefits to the people that are here. Tom's plan is to, to bring back the fish, to bring back people coming to the lakes to go boating, people that will come and ride their bikes on the bike trail. Just enjoy the lake like we did. I'm optimistic today, just like I was the day we started. It has been a total all hands on deck effort. Well, the story of Lake Wichita is as much about tenacity, passion, and having the vision and finding a way to make it happen. That's what's exciting. It's a, it's a monumental effort, it's a Herculean task, but the juice is worth the squeeze. You know, when we're done, we're gonna have our lake back for 100 plus years bringing social, economic, recreational benefits. That's a heck of a deal.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.